Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this month's edition of Book Buzz. My name is Betty McDowell, and I'm joined by Shermaine Burleson and Meg Miller. We're all librarians here at Pflugerville Public Library. Shermaine will be covering adult fiction, I'll be covering adult nonfiction, and Meg will be covering adult graphic novels. A couple of quick things before we get started. I just want to let you know you can get personalized book recommendations through our website. Just go to the Books and Media section, and under a adult book lists, we have our Your Next Reads and Book Bundles forms. So you can either get recommendations emailed to you or you can get surprise books checked out to you that you can pick up via curbside. And coming up in June, we do have our Adult Summer Reading Program Challenge. If you did it last year, it'll be similar, except this year we have even more categories for you to choose from. So just read eight books in any of these categories between June 5th and July 31st, and the first 100 people to complete the online form will get a prize, and that is sponsored by Friends of the Library, so thanks to them for that. And now I'm going to hand it off to Shermaine, who's going to be covering adult fiction, and I'll be back with adult nonfiction. Hi, my name is Shermaine Burleson, and I'm the Cataloging and Technical Services Librarian at Fogerville Public Library, and I'm going to share some books with you today. Accidentally Engaged is about a Muslim woman who fakes an engagement to the boy next door um, in hopes of winning a couple's cooking contest. So um, Rima's parents have found her yet another potential um, good Muslim husband. And this one has like the body like Captain America and he's British accent and he lives right across the hall and he's perfect mouth watering temptation to her. And it's completely ruined by the fact that her parents are interfering and that he works for her father. So she won't be attached to him because of this. Um, but it turns out that she needed him more than she thought. And when this baking opportunity of a lifetime presents itself um, as a couple's competition, and the prize of her dreams is offered, like Remo will do anything to win. And she even asks Nadine to pretend that they're engaged. But when it comes to love, um, it doesn't always mean you get your cake and you can eat it too. So this is the reckoning and the figuring out of that. But that's what accidentally engaged means. The final revival of Opal and Nev um, so basically, this is a novel about this meteoric rise of this iconic interracial rock duo and their sensational breakup and the dark secrets that are unearthed when they try to reunite decades later. So Opal is Afropunk before it was even a term that existed. And she's coming of age in Detroit and she can't imagine like the nine to five job. So she believes she's a star. So this aspiring British Singer-songwriter Neville Charles discovers her in Amateur Bar Night, and she takes him up on the offer to make rock music together at Rivington Records, which is um, slowly becoming like this fledging music company. And so it's the early 70s in New York City, and she's just finding her niche in like the funky town that New York is. And then... Um, she is basically kind of like using her voice to be a protester of wrongs that she feels are happening um, around her. And it not only changes her life, but the loves that she has. And also um, there's like a deadly reminder of the repercussions that are always harder for women to have to deal with, especially black women who dare to speak the truth. So fast forward decades later, and it's 2016, and Opal's thinking about a reunion with Nev. This, mu this music journalist, um, Sunny Sheldon, she seizes the opportunity to kind of like curate this oral history for them. And she also wants to uncover deeper secrets about like what's going on and like these allegations that have come up from years and years and things that are threatening to blow all of this up. So this is... Um, like a contemporary fiction, but the structure and all of it are, um, you know, mirroring similar things that are happening currently in current events and times and things like that. And just daring to speak your truth and how you do that. 
Um, Liberty is about a young woman, um, a black young woman who is finding her place and how you can fulfill that and be yourself. So this is the coming age of a free black woman during the reconstruction period in Brooklyn and reconstruction is the period before Jim Crow, but after the civil war um, and the country is trying to rebuild itself. And so her mother is a black woman doctor and she's a practicing physician and she has like this vision that they're going to be these two doctors and do all these things. But Liberty doesn't want to go to medical school. She wants to do music. That's her love. And so she's drawn to music and she's drawn to music more than science, but she doesn't want to disappoint her mom. And this is the vision that her mom has had for her life. So when a young man from Haiti proposes to Liberty, and he promises like this life she knows because she's not um, like her mother and she's not light skinned and not passing that her life is going to be difficult. It has proven to be so in many different ways. And so she takes him up on this and she kind of finds out that um, the path to freedom that she thought she had is not as open as she would have liked and that as a black woman, she struggles with um, what might be the consequences for herself and for generations to come if she doesn't figure out her path and where it needs to be because she, as a married woman, is still oppressed in ways that she was hoping she wouldn't be and in ways she hoped she wouldn't be in Haiti, but it kind of turns out different than what she thought. And so this is about like I said about um, finding yourself and being like fully who you are and um, the path to that. Um, the Lies We Bury is the story of Marissa Moe who was uh, captured and she was, uh, she escaped from like this basement prison. And two decades later, when she's a 27 year old woman, she has moved and changed her name and she works as a freelance photographer. But when she accepts this job uh, to cover like basically murders that have happened in Portland, um, it's impossible for her not to remember her escape and things that have happened. So everything seems eerily familiar to her. Like it has the same underground layers that she was in, um, their little trinkets and toys that are left behind identical to those that um, Marissa had as a child. And then there's like this note meant just for her that says, see you soon, Missy. So she's determined that the killer is out there and that he is somebody, he or she, somebody that she knows. And she like has to retrieve her long forgotten memories to return to the past to figure out like how to face her fears. But somebody else is like going on this journey with her. And is she going to remain safe? Is she not? Is thing, are things coming to a head? No. Um, Since by Isabella Castillo is uh, this is a, a thriller slash love triangle. So this is about a bisexual love triangle, love triangle that, um, resurfaces 20 years later. So Paris is proof that love exists in the air and in the streets and behind closed doors that love is everywhere. So Clementine and Edward's last child leaves home and the cracks in their marriage are like, you can't ignore them anymore. And Clementine works as an artisan perfumer and it's no longer rewarding for her in the sense that it's um, actually starting to be a uh, uh, a little burdensome for her now and it's exhausting and so um her life is starting to tilt and then um her old lover comes back so rasha comes back and she's like uh what do you want from me if it's not revenge like what's going on so this is set in paris and provence and this is like an intimate portrait of a woman navigating conflicting desires 
and a troubled past while dreaming of like this future that is more fulfilling than the way her life is right now. So Pieces is about um, Otto and Xavier Shin and they love each other and they are moving forward in their life and they're gifted this unusual train voyage. So there's a lot of magical realism going on here. But um, an aunt gives them a trip on a sleeper car train to mark their new commitment to each other and to basically get them out of her house for a little bit. So they start off this journey with their pet mongoose and Otto and Xavier are um, starting to realize that the lucky day, which was a tea smuggling train um, in its former day, and it has all these things beyond their wildest dreams and imaginations and favorite breakfasts and like all these mystery uh, touches and welcoming touches that are geared like towards them specifically that keep coming up. And it seems like they're the only people on the train. So why are all these things just centered like towards them? And they're just like thinking about it and wondering like, oh, it's kind of cool. But what is this about? And so... Um, they seem to be the only people, but then Otto discovers there's like the secretive woman who issues like this surprise message to them. And there's like all this further chaos and questions that pile up as a trip. Um, every day there's like something new that kind of like comes up and Otto and Xavier are starting to wonder, like, do they, um, know each other? And their past and everything that keep piling up and things that keep connecting. Like, do they know each other? Like, they think they do. And what if you thought um, the things that you thought were family in the past and and of family in the past and your turns in life are like, have been right there all along. And what does that mean? The Truth and Other Hidden Things by Lee Geller. So this is a story. Um, it's a funny, heartfelt story about this woman who secret life and the stories that she tells and the thrill of notoriety and of being noticed are like unveiled, unraveled. So uh, Belle basically finds out that um, her IUD is not working at all, did not work. And her husband, Harry, has been denied tenure at the Ma Manhattan University that he's been at all this time. And so they move to the Hudson Valley, basically, where he lands this job at Duchess College in a town called Peak Hill. So it's like a farm to table utopia and kombucha runs amok and... Belle decides to become a blogger and under the pen name County Duchess, she anonymously like dishes out a life about the hipsters and the hyper competitive yummy mommies and daddies and all these different things in Big Kill. But um, her blog starts to become popular and her. I guess you could say her curiosity or nosiness. Um, intensifies and she finds out this scandal that's been right under her nose all this time and she says something about it and it becomes viral and soon everyone is like who is this person because her husband's job is in jeopardy um, details of her children's lives are being um, like derailed and like all these types of things and the one friend that she has she could possibly lose that friendship and so is it worth Losing the people close to you to feel noticed by everyone. That's what Belle has to discover. The Last Exiles is about um, a young couple in North Korea and their fight for love and freedom. So they're in Poyong and uh, they meet basically in college. And she is a journalist and she's from this prominent family. And uh, Jen is from this small village. And he doesn't have very much money. But outside of school, um, North Korea has kind of like fallen into like this political upheaval. And so when Jin has to go back home, to, he finds out his family is starving. And um, 
he has to make this rash decision that will haunt him for the rest of his life. And miles away, Suja is uh, beginning to feel like what privilege really, really means. So she's feeling her privilege. And then she learns that um, Gia is missing. So she is going to find him. And she embarks on this journey that leads her down like all these criminally minded things and places that she had never even been before. And she is basically discovering how she needs or how or what she needs to do to survive. So she's like never had to do these things before. And she's like, I'm, I got to find him. He's missing. And she wasn't prepared for all the things she had to do for that to happen. So, um, this is about, uh, this is based on a true story about the experiences of two young lovers. And um, it's about love and sacrifice and the price of freedom and liberty, basically. The last bookshop in London. So this is a tale about literacy and love and friendship and survival against uh, World War II London. And it reminds us to hope in the sanctuary of neighborhoods and bookstores and um, war and unrest. So basically, this is August of 39, and London's preparing for war with Hitler and the forces that are sweeping across Europe. And Grace Bennett always wanted to move to the city, but <laughs> she's met with blackout curtains and bunkers. And when she arrives, it's not at all the London that she expected. So she certainly never imagine that she wind up working at Primrose, this old bookstore in the heart of London. And during the blackouts and the air raids and the blitz that's happening, that's intensifying. And um, if you don't know what the blitz is, um, it was basically Germany's um, attack strategy when they were trying to take over like cities. Um, so they would basically just like bomb anything and anyone. So they didn't have targets per se. They would just bomb anything building or structure. And they would basically catch on fire and a lot of people um, died in London as a result. Um, and sometimes bunkers weren't even safe because those could be bombed as well. Um, and so through all of this, she discovers that she has the power of storytelling and she unites her community. And it wasn't anything that she ever thought she would do. And these triumphs, uh, basically in the darkest nights, I basically helped people survive. Um, you, so this is a you novel. If you've seen the Netflix series, you, um, this is the new novel about the deviant antisocial Joe Goldberg, the savvy bookseller. So Joe is basically done with cities and he's done with um, everything that goes with it, with love. And he's like, I'm going to nature and I'm doing all these things and I'm mm, going to be fine. I'm not going to think about anything. So he moves to the Pacific Northwest so he can just breathe. And he gets a job at the local library because he does have experience with books. And this is where he meets Mary Kay DeMarco. She's a librarian. So he decides I'm not going to meddle with her life. I won't. I'll win her the old fashioned way. And I'll provide a shoulder to cry on and a helping hand. And then over time, they both will heal their wounds and they'll begin happily ever after. But the problem is Mary Kay is already has a life. She's a mother and she's a friend and she's busy. So um, Joe is like true love between people happens and you have to be willing to make room for the real thing. And he's been there. And so he is undying support and she will see that he is the right thing and will make room in her life for him. So, of course, we know how that goes, but this is the new you book. So Hannah Kong carries on. Um, if you're a fan of You Got Mail, this is um, a similar story about a young woman who's juggling her dream job at this radio station while helping her family um, compete with a new halal restaurant. So halal means is it's just like um, food that is safe to eat or that has been designated is the um, clean food that you can eat as a Muslim. So she 
has a restaurant with her family and it's like a rom-com based on around her finding her voice at the radio station competing with this intern um the name of the restaurant is the three sisters biryani poutine it's in the golden crescent neighborhood of toronto and she's a waitress at the restaurant but she's also the part-time radio personality she has this podcast that people love and that's what she wants to do she doesn't want to just work for her family um but then some cousins come into town and they arrive from india for like this surprise visit and there's this long held buried secret that they're uncovering together and then when a hate motivated attack on the neighborhood um complicates like the situation further she has like this growing attraction to Aiden who is the young halal um rival restaurant tour and he has an upscale halal restaurant and life in the golden crescent is like starting to unravel and she has to find her voice in all of that buried is about witches so it's not just about witches it is a novel of gore death blood witches swamps uh frankenstein monsters necromancy sisterhood deep friendship and asexuality so uh queen uh's mistake wasn't killing leo ashwood it was bringing him back so now there's this cat and mouse game of trying to stay alive and trying to figure out what she's going to do with the monster she created and then learning about the powers that she has and what she's capable of so she and um she has this vision and another seer um Celia basically um they become entangled in trying to find Leo and stop him and Celia is a seer who is um known for like not minding her own business basically and so now her and Quinn have to try to uh develop her own powers and then like she's developing feelings for Quinn and then Maggie comes in and so they form like this little coven and and Maggie is like a YouTube kind of like up and coming star but she has been struck with this sickness and she finds out that her voice and her magical powers and that survival and death are wrapped up all together so the three of them have to learn to trust each other to navigate the world and their powers and they have to keep all of that a secret at the same time so rider of die my rider die by Lizzie Cohen is <laughs> it's a comedy about um these millennial women who are two friends and they decide to give up the search for the perfect man and devote their lives to each other uh but their plans begin to unravel with unexpected consequences so they decide to buy a brownstone and fix it up and live together and just have men as like hobbies or to fix things basically and so Amanda and Sophie decide to form this new type of covenant commitment and they decide enough is enough um Amanda's kind of like a, a sh- in her professional life she's pretty good she's a lawyer but her personal life kind of sucks her words basically and she's hypochondriac and it's just like life is just not easy for her and Sophie is the opposite she's like this artist who lived all over the world and she doesn't crumble or fall apart period and they've been through a lot together but both of them have in common that their love lives tend to implode often and so they decide to form this alliance to do all these things together and just basically become like this power couple without being together and just like men are just like the side to that um but um what happens when that doesn't quite work out the way that you want it to and they must reconsider if their life they're beginning to build should they keep it going or how far are they going to go to keep that going and so it's about female friendship at its finest and must friendship always come second to love her three lives so basically this is a story um kind of in the gaslighting vein with high tech 
So this is a high tech thriller and basically a home invasion upends this family's life. So in her public life, Jade seems to have it all. And she's an up and coming social media influencer. And she's a beautiful new home with her successful architect fiance. But his kids think the divorce from their mom is a midlife crisis and her Caribbean and his, um, you know, Connecticut upbringing don't always get together. So then a home invasion happens and Greg has a traumatic brain injury and he is basically um, stuck at home. And so he's obsessed with the camera system that he's newly installed. And like this home invasion makes him think that this wasn't an accident, that there may be uh, Jade that would prefer him to be dead than alive. And so he's dealing with that and like um, it's everything he thought like a lie. And how is he going to protect the family? The Others by Sarah Blau is about a group of women who make a pact based on um, the women in the Torah who are considered childless and are called the Others, but they are willing to be willingly child free. And um, so Sheila gets a call that Diana, her um, old friend, uh, who is an Israeli like feminist, like a prominent feminist in Israel, that she's found murdered with a doll placed in her hand. So she's like, OK, something is up with that. When more women start to get murdered um, and the dolls are placed, she's like, um, is somebody making her pay the ultimate price for making the choice she made and was it the right choice? So this is another psychological thriller. The other side of the door is about um, what's more dangerous, an enemy, a friend, or a lover. So this is about the weight of lies and the price of betrayal and suspicion. So Bonnie Graham arrives at her boyfriend's apartment in London and she's horrified to find a dead body in a pool of blood. But she doesn't call the police. She cleans it up. She hides the body and then wipes away any evidence that there ever was anything there. And Bonnie, what does she do? She's a music teacher. And she spent like this long summer in London rehearsing with this band to play at this friend's wedding. And it was supposed to be fun. But then everybody starts like unraveling and secrets are exposed and everything is starting to unravel. And what's meant to be a summer of happiness and music turns into like this deadly game where lovers are betraying each other and passions turn murderous and friendships itself become like a crime. So everyone lies, but is anyone prepared to tell the truth to uncover a murder? Um, all the things I meant to tell you by Tiffany L. Warren, and um, I will give a trigger warning that there is um, sexual assault. Um, in this book as a topic or a trope in this book. And so this is about the lengths that these friends went to, these six, three successful 40-year-old women, 40-something, um, that they went on this search for Mr. Right. And they found, like, the satisfaction and commitment and everything they believed to be possible but with their bold new choices come like these unexpected challenges. So um, Kimberly, who was used to be shy and she has a love she's longed for, but his baggage, well, her baggage and his past relationships um, are starting to turn like their dream into this nightmare. So meanwhile, um, Hannah is at odds with that. Like, there's this business uh, revival going on and all this money to be made. And she is in a relationship, with this writer that she loves, and she's tempted big time by the man that got away. And Twyla is still willing from the sexual assault and she's out for revenge, no matter what the personal outcome. And now the three of them have to pull on their sisterhood and their bonds and um, to see if they can overcome a breaking point that may or may not happen 
and hold on to their sanity and to their hard won happiness. So how are these friends going to do that? So I hope you enjoyed um, that and you can reach me by my email and feel free feel free to reach me through my email and to um, talk to me about books you would like to see in the library, books you would like to read. Um, drop me a line about what you've read, maybe that I've done on the book buzz that you like, some feedback like that. I really appreciate it. Okay, so I'm going to be going over some books for you in adult nonfiction. First up, we have some biographies and memoirs. We have Crying in H Mart, a memoir by Michelle Zahner. With humor and heart, Michelle Zahner tells of growing up one of the few Asian American kids at her school in Eugene, Oregon, of struggling with her mother's particular high expectations of her, of a painful adolescence, of treasured months spent in her grandmother's tiny apartment in Seoul, where she and her mother would bond late at night over heaping plates of food. As she grew up moving to the East Coast for college, finding work in the restaurant industry, and performing gigs with her fledgling band, and meeting the man who would become her husband. Her Koreanness began to feel ever more distant, even as she found the life she wanted to live. It was her mother's diagnosis of terminal cancer when Michelle was 25 that forced a reckoning with her identity and brought her to reclaim the gifts of taste, language, and history her mother had given her. Rich with intimate anecdotes that will resonate wildly and complete, complete with family photos, Crying in H Mart is a book to cherish, share, and reread. William Still, The Underground Railroad and the Angel at Philadelphia by William C. Cassius. William Still, The Underground Railroad and the Angel at Philadelphia is the first major biography of the free black abolitionist William Still, who coordinated the Eastern Line of the Underground Railroad and was a pillar of the railroad as a whole. Based in Philadelphia, Still built a reputation as a courageous leader, writer, philanthropist, and guide for fugitive slaves. This monumental work details Still's life story beginning with his parents' escape from bondage in the early 19th century and continuing through his youth and adulthood as one of the nation's most important Underground Railroad agents, and later as an early civil rights pioneer. Still worked personally with Harriet Tubman, assisted the family of John Brown, helped Brown's associates escape from Harper's Ferry after their famous raid, and was a rival to Frederick Douglass among nationally prominent African-American abolitionists. Still's life story is told in the broader context of the anti-slavery movement, Philadelphia Quaker and free, free black history and the generational conflict that occurred between Still and a younger group of free black activists led by Octavius Caddo. For scholars and general readers interested in the history of the anti-slavery movement and the operation of the Underground Railroad, as well as genealogists tracing African-American ancestors. Somebody's Daughter, a memoir by Ashley C. Ford. Through poverty, adolescence, and a fraught relationship with her mother, Ashley Ford wishes she could turn to her father for hope and encouragement. There are just a few problems. He's in prison, and she doesn't know what he did to end up there. She doesn't know how to deal with the incessant worries that keep her up at night or how to handle the changes in her body that draw unwanted attention from men. In her search for unconditional love, Ashley begins dating a boy her mother hates. When the relationship turns sour, he assaults her. Then her grandmother reveals the truth about her father's incarceration and Ashley's entire world is turned upside down. Somebody's daughter steps into the world of growing up a poor black girl in Indiana with a family fragmented by incarceration, exploring how isolating and complex such a childhood can be. As Ashley battles her body and her environment, she embarks on a powerful journey to find the threads between who she is and what she was born into and the complicated familial love that often binds them. Next, we have How to Be Human, An Autistic Man's Guide to Life by Jory Fleming and Lyric Winnick. As a child, Jory Fleming was racked by uncontrollable tantrums, had no tolerance for people, and couldn't manage the outside world. Slightly more than a decade later, he was bound for England, selected to attend one of the world's premier universities. How to Be Human explores life amid a world, of construct a life amid a world constructed for neurotypical brains when yours is not. But the miracle of this book is that instead of dwelling on Jory's limitations, those who inhabit the neurotypical world will begin to better understand their own. They will contemplate what language cannot say, how linear thinking leads to dead ends, and how nefarious emotions can be, particularly when, in Jory's words, they are weaponized. 
Through a series of deep personal conversations with writer Lyric Winnick, Jory makes a compelling case for logical empathy based on rational thought, asks why we tolerate friends who see us as a means to an end, and explain why he believes personality is a choice. Most movingly, he discusses how, after many hardships, he maintains a deep, abiding faith. Join Jory and Lyric as they examine what it means to be human and ultimately how each of us might become a better one. And now we have some science books, and we're starting with A Brief History of Earth, Four Billion Years in Eight Chapters by Andrew H. Knoll. Odds are, where you're standing was once cooking under a roiling sea of lava, crushed by a towering sheet of ice, rocked by a nearby meteor strike, or perhaps choked by poison gases, drowned beneath ocean, perched atop a mountain range, or roamed by fearsome monsters, probably most or even all of the above. The story of our home planet and the organisms spread across its surface is far more spectacular than any Hollywood blockbuster, filled with enough plot twists to rival a best-selling thriller. But only recently have we begun to piece together the whole mystery into co a coherent narrative. Drawing on his decades of field research and up-to-the-minute understanding of the latest science, renowned geologist Andrew H. Knoll delivers a rigorous yet accessible biography of Earth, charting our home planet's epic 4.6 billion year history. Placing 21st century climate change in deep context, A Brief History of Earth is an indispensable look at where we've been and where we're going. First Steps, How Upright Walking Made Us Human by Jeremy De Silva. Humans are the only mammals to walk on two rather than four legs, a locomotion known as bipedalism. Why and how exactly did we take our first steps and at what cost? Bipedalism has its drawbacks. Giving birth is more difficult and dangerous. Our running speed is much slower than other animals. And we suffer a variety of ailments from hernias to sinus problems. In first steps, paleoanthropologist Jeremy, Jeremy De Silva explores how unusual and extraordinary this seemingly ordinary ability is. A seven million year journey to the very origins of the human lineage, first steps shows how upright walking was a gateway to many of the other attributes that make us human. From our technological abilities, our thirst for exploration, our use of language, and may have laid the foundation for our species' traits of compassion, empathy, and altruism. Moving from developmental psychology labs to ancient fossil sites throughout Africa and Eurasia, De Silva brings to life our adventure walking on two legs. Next we have Beyond, the astonishing story of the first human to leave our planet and journey into space by Stephen Walker. 9.07 a.m. on April 12, 1961, a top secret rocket site in the USSR, a young Russian sits inside a tiny capsule on top of the Soviet Union's most powerful intercontinental ballistic missile, originally designed to carry a nuclear warhead and blast into the skies. His name is Yuri Gagarin, and he is about to make history. Traveling at almost 18,000 miles per hour, 10 times faster than a bullet, Gagarin circles the globe in just 106 minutes. From his windows, he sees the earth as nobody has before, crossing a sunset and a sunrise, crossing oceans and continents, witnessing its beauty and its fragility. While his launch begins in total secrecy, within hours of his landing, he has become a world celebrity, the first human to leave the planet. Beyond tells the thrilling story behind that epic flight on its 60th anniversary. Drawing on extensive original research and the vivid testimony of eyewitnesses, many of whom have never spoken before. Stephen Walker unpacks secrets that were hidden for decades and takes the reader into the drama of one of humanity's greatest adventures. To the scientists, engineers, and political leaders on both sides, and above all, to the American astronauts and their Soviet rivals battling for supremacy in the heavens. And next from Kate Moore, we have the woman they could not silence. One woman, her incredible fight for freedom, and the men who tried to make her disappear. The year is 1860. As the clash between the states rolls slowly to a boil, Elizabeth Packard, housewife and mother of six, is facing her own battle. The enemy sits across the table and sleeps in the next room. Her husband of 21 years is plotting against her because he feels increasingly threatened by Elizabeth's intellect, independence, and unwillingness to stifle her own thoughts. So Theophilus makes a plan to put his wife back in her place. One summer morning, he has her committed to an asylum. The horrific conditions inside the Illinois State Hospital in Jacksonville, Illinois, are overseen by Dr. Andrew McFarlane, a man who will prove to be even more dangerous to Elizabeth than her traitorous husband. 
But most disturbing is that Elizabeth is not the only sane woman confined to the institution. There are many rational women on her board who tell the same story. They've been committed not because they need medical treatment, but to keep them in line. Conveniently labeled crazy, so their voices are ignored. No one is willing to fight for their freedom, and disenfranchised both by gender and the stigma of their supposed madness, they cannot possibly fight for themselves. But Elizabeth is about to discover that the merit of losing everything is that then you have nothing to lose. Elizabeth courageously fought for her own freedom, and in doing so, freed millions more. Her refusal to be silenced and her ceaseless quest for justice not only challenged the medical science of the day and led to a giant leap forward in human rights, it also showcased the most salutary lesson. Sometimes the greatest heroes we have are those inside ourselves. And now we have some true crime. Starting with Don't Call It a Cult, the shocking story of Keith Rainier and the Women of Nexium by Sarah Berman. They draw you in with the promise of empowerment, self-discovery, women helping women. The more secretive those connections are, the more elusive you feel. Little did you know, you just joined a cult. Sex trafficking, self-help coaching, forced labor, mentorship, multi-level marketing, gaslighting. Investigative journalist Sarah Berman explores the shocking practices of Nexium, a cult run by Keith Rainier and many enablers. Through the accounts of central Nexium figures, Berman uncovers how dozens of women seeking creative coaching and networking opportunities instead were blackmailed, literally branded, near starved, and enslaved. Don't Call It a Cult is a riveting account of Nexium's rise to power, its ability to evade prosecution for decades, and the investigation that finally revealed its dark secrets to the world. And by Rebecca Rosenberg and Salem Alger, we have At Any Cost, A Father's Betrayal, A Wife's Murder, and A Ten-Year War for Justice. Wealthy, beautiful, and brilliant, Shelley Denishevsky had fulfillment at her fingertips. Having conquered Wall Street, she was eager to build a family with her much younger husband, promising Ivy League graduate Rod Kovlin. But when his hidden vices surfaced, marital harmony gave way to a merciless divorce. Rod had long depended on Shelley's income to fund his taste for high-stakes backgammon and infidelity, and she finally vowed to sever him from her will. In late December 2009, Shelley made an appointment with her lawyer to block him from her millions. She would never make it to that meeting. Two days later, on New Year's Eve, Shelley was found dead in the bathtub of her Upper West Side apartment. Police ruled it an accident, and Shelley's deeply Orthodox Jewish family quickly buried her without an autopsy on religious grounds. Rod had a clear path to his ex-wife's fortune, but suspicions about her death lingered. As the two families warred over custody of Shelley's children and their inheritance, Rod concocted a series of increasingly demented schemes, even plotting to kill his own parents to secure the treasure. And as investigators closed in, Rod committed a final desperate act to frame his daughter for her mother's death. Journalists Rebecca Rosenberg and Salim Algar reconstruct the 10 years that passed between the day Shelley was found dead and the day her killer faced justice in this riveting account of how one man's irrepressible greed devolved into obsession, manipulation, and murder. And by Glenn Stout, we have Tiger Girl and the Candy Kid, America's original gangster couple. Before Bonnie and Clyde, there was Tiger Girl and the Candy Kid. In the wake of war, a pandemic, and an economic depression, Margaret and Richard Whitmore, two love-struck working-class kids from Baltimore, reached for the dream of a better life. In the heart of the jazz age, they headed up a gang that in less than a year stole over $1 million worth of diamonds and precious gems which would be about $50 million worth of gems today. Set against the backdrop of the excesses of the Roaring Twenties, their story takes us from the jailhouse to the speakeasy, from the cabarets where they celebrated good times to the gallows where their story finally came to an end. Tiger Girl and the Candy Kid is a tale of rags to riches, tragedy, and infamy. And next up, we have some history books. And we'll start with Murder at the Mission, A Frontier Killing, Its Legacy of Lies, and the Taking of the American West by Blaine Hardin. In 1836, two missionaries and their wives were among the first Americans to cross the Rockies by covered wagon on what would become the Oregon Trail. Dr. Marcus Whitman and Reverend Henry Spaulding were headed to present-day Washington State in Idaho, where they aimed to convert members of the Cayuse and Nez Perce tribes. Both would fail spectacularly as missionaries, but Spalding would succeed as a propagandist, inventing a story that recast his friend as a hero and helped to fuel the massive westward migration that would eventually lead to the devastation of those they had purportedly set out to save. 
Exposing the hucksterism and self-interest at the root of American mythmaking, Murder at the Mission reminds us the cost of American expansion and of the problems that arise when history is told only by the victors. And by Tia Miles, we have All That She Carried, The Journey of Ashley Sack, a Black Family Keepsake. In a display case in the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture sits a rough cotton bag called Ashley Sack, embroidered with just a handful of words that evoke a sweeping family story of loss and of love passed down through the generations. In 1850, South Carolina, an enslaved woman named Rose gave this sack filled with a few precious items to her daughter Ashley as a token of love and to try to ensure Ashley's survival as well. Soon after, the nine-year-old girl was separated from her mother and sold. Decades later, Ashley's granddaughter, Ruth, embroidered this family history on the bag in spare yet haunting language, including Rose's wish that it be filled with my love always. Now in this illuminating, deeply moving book inspired by Rose's gift to Ashley, historian Tia Miles carefully unearths these women's faint presence in archival records to follow the paths of their lives and the lives of so many women like them to write a singular and revelatory history of the experience of slavery and the uncertain freedom afterward in the United States. And by Dorothy Wickenden, we have The Agitators, Three Friends Who Fought for Abolition and Women's Rights. Harriet Tubman, no nonsense, funny, uncannily prescient, and strategically brilliant, was one of the most important conductors of the Underground Railroad. Harriet worked for the Union Army in South Carolina as a nurse and a spy and took part in a river raid in which 750 enslaved people were freed from rice plantations. Martha Wright, Quaker mother of seven, a dangerous woman in the eyes of her neighbors and a harsh critic of Lincoln's policy on slavery, organized women's rights and abolitionist conventions with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And Frances Seward, the wife of Governor, then Senator, then Secretary of State William H. Seward, gave freedom seekers money and referrals and aided in their education. The most conventional of these three friends, she hid her radicalism in public, behind the scenes. She argued strenuously with her husband about the urgency of immediate abolition. Beginning two decades before the Civil War, when Harriet Tubman was still enslaved and Martha and Frances were young women bound by law and tradition, the agitators ends two decades after the war in a radically changed United States. Wickenden brings this extraordinary period of our history to life through the richly detailed letters her characters wrote several times a week. Wickenden's The Agitators is revelatory, riveting, and profoundly relevant to our own time. And by Brian Burroughs, Chris Tomlinson, and Jason Stanford, we have Forget the Alamo, The Rise and Fall of an American Myth. Every nation needs its creation myth, and since Texas was a nation before it was a state, it's no surprise that its myths bite deep. There's no piece of history more important to Texans than the Battle of the Alamo. When Davy Crockett and a band of rebels went down in a blaze of glory, fighting for independence from Mexico, losing the battle, but setting Texas up to win the war. However, that version of events, as Forget the Alamo shows, was more to fantasy than reality. Just as the site of the Alamo was left in ruins for decades, its story was forgotten and twisted over time. With the contributions of Tejanos, Texans of Mexican origin who fought alongside the Anglo rebels, scrubbed from the record, and the origin of the conflict over Mexico's push to abolish slavery papered over. Forget the Alamo provocatively explains the true story of the battle against the backdrop of Texas's struggle for independence, then shows how the sausage of myth got made in the Jim Crow South of the late 19th and early 20th century. Three noted Texan writers combined forces to tell the real story of the Alamo, dispelling the myths, exploring why they had their day for so long, and explaining why the ugly fight about its meaning is now coming to a head. And by Annette Gordon-Reed, we have On Juneteenth. Weaving together American history, dramatic family chronicle, and searing episodes of memoir, Annette Gordon-Reed's On Juneteenth provides a historian's view of the country's long road to Juneteenth, recounting both its origins in Texas and the enormous hardships that African Americans have endured in the centuries since, from Reconstruction through Jim Crow and beyond. All too aware of the stories of cowboys, ranchers, and oil men that have long dominated the lore of the Lone Star State, Gordon Reed, herself a Texas native and the descendant of enslaved people brought to Texas as early as 1820s, forges a new and profoundly truthful narrative of her home state with implications for us all. Combining personal anecdotes with poignant facts gleaned from the annals of American history, Gordon Reed shows how, from the earliest presence of Black people in Texas to the day in Galveston on June 19, 1865, 
when Major Gordon, Major General Gordon Granger announced the end of legalized slavery in the state, African Americans played an integral role in the Texas story. Reworking the traditional Alamo framework, she powerfully demonstrates, among other things, that the slave and race-based economy not only defined the fractious era of Texas independence, but precipitated the Mexican-American War and indeed the Civil War itself. And by Daniel James Brown, we have Facing the Mountain, a true story of Japanese-American heroes in World War II. They came from across the continent and Hawaii. Their parents taught them to embrace both their Japanese heritage and the ways of their American homeland. They faced bigotry, yet they believed in their bright futures as American citizens. But within days of Pearl Harbor, the FBI was ransacking their houses and locking up their fathers. And within months, many would find themselves living behind barbed wire. Facing the Mountain is an unforgettable chronicle of wartime America and the battlefields of Europe. Based on Daniel James Brown's extensive interviews with the families of the protagonists, as well as deep archival research, it portrays the kaleidoscopic journey of four Japanese-American families and their sons who volunteered for the 442nd Regimental Combat Team and were deployed to France, Germany, Germany and Italy, where they were asked to do the near impossible. And we have some psychology books, starting with You Are Your Best Thing, Vulnerability, Shame, Resilience, and the Black Experience by Toronto Burke and Brene Brown. Toronto Burke, founder of the Me Too movement and researcher and writer Brene Brown, joined forces to write about the Black experience with vulnerability and shame resilience. Burke and Brown are the perfect pair to usher in the stark, potent collection of essays on Black shame and healing. Along with the anthology contributors, they create a space to recognize and process the trauma of white supremacy, a space to be vulnerable and affirm the fullness of Black love and Black life. It includes contributions by Keith Lehman, Imani Perry, Laverne Cox, Jason Reynolds, Austin Channing Brown, and more. And we have a couple of travel books, starting with Anthony Bourdain's World Travel and a Reverent Guide. Anthony Bourdain saw more of the world than nearly anyone. His travels took him from the hidden pockets of his hometown of New York to a tribal longhouse in Borneo, from cosmo cosmopolitan Buenos Aires, Paris, and Shanghai, to Tanzania's utter beauty and the stunning desert solitude of Oman's empty quarter and many places beyond. In world travel, a life of experience is collected into an entertaining, practical, fun, and frank travel guide that gives readers an introduction to some of his favorite places in his own words featuring essential advice on how to get there, what to eat, where to stay, and in some cases, what to avoid. World travel provides essential context that will help readers further appreciate the reasons why Bourdain found a place enchanting and memorable. And by Juan Viora, we have Horizontal Vertigo, a city called Mexico. Horizontal Vertigo, the title refers to the fear of ever impending earthquakes that led Mexicans to build their capital city outward rather than upward. Juan Villoro wanders through Mexico City seemingly without a plan, describing people, places, and things, while brilliantly drawing connections among them. In doing so, he reveals, in all its multitudinous glory, the vicissitudes and triumphs of the city's cultural, political, and social history, from indigenous antiquity to the Aztec period, from Spanish conquest to Mexico City today, one of the world's leading cultural and financial centers. In this deeply iconoclastic book, Vito organizes his text around a recurring series of topics, living in the city, city characters, shocks, crossings, and ceremonies. What he achieves miraculously is a stunning, intriguingly coherent meditation on Mexico City's spirit. And last, we've got a humor book for you by John Paul Brammer, Hola Papi, How to Come Out in a Walmart Parking Lot and Other Life Lessons. What started as a racialized moniker given to John Paul or J.P. Brammer on a hookup app soon became the inspiration for his now wildly popular advice column, Ola Bapi, launching his career as the Cheryl Strayed for young queer people everywhere, and some straight people too. J.P. had his doubts at first. What advice could he really offer while he himself stumbled through his early 20s? Sometimes the best advice to dole out comes from looking within, which is what J.P. has done in his column and book, and readers have flocked to him for honest, heartfelt wisdom and, of course, a few laughs. In Ola Papi, JP, JP shares his story of growing up biracial and in the closet against the backdrop of America's heartland while attempting to answer some of life's toughest questions. Like, how do I let go of the past? 
How do I become the person I want to be? Is there such a thing as being too gay? Should I hook up with my grade school bully now that he's out of the closet? Questions we've all asked ourselves, surely. With wit and wisdom in equal measure, Ola Papi is for anyone, gay, straight, and everything in between, who has taken stock of their unique place in the world, offering considered advice, intelligent discord, and fists of laughter along the way. Thank you so much for joining me. You can email me at bettym at fliggervilletx.gov. That's B-E-T-T-E-M at P-F-L-U-G-E-R-V-I-L-L-E-T-X dot G-O-V. If you have any questions about the books I presented or just adult nonfiction in general. And now I'm going to pass it off to Meg, who's going to be going over adult graphic novels. Hello, Meg Miller, an adult services librarian, and I bring you the adult graphic novel titles for our book buzzes. This month, I approach my portion of book buzz a bit differently. Instead of giving you a list in just chronological order or by publisher, I've grouped titles into these categories to highlight that there are a wide variety of stories being told in graphic novels. These are very general, and you'll notice that the titles could fall into multiple categories, like many stories. So let's get started with memoir and biography, which are pretty uniquely suited to the graphic format. In Twister from Graphic Monday, the last thing Pedro remembers is diving into the lake on his day off from work. Now he lies in a hospital bed with a wheelchair at his side, casting his shadow from the doorway. His caretaker remarks on how quickly one gets used to this kind of thing as she goes on to empty his catheter bag and to help him into his wheelchair. Pedro must now deal with a growing mix of fear and powerlessness that surges within him as he realizes that he will be paralyzed forever. It bursts forth like a twister over and over again until he resigns himself to it. In time, Pedro's feelings of hopelessness are offset by the realization that he can find both love and a degree of independence. With the support of his friends and family, he makes his way through rehab and finally gets back to the business of living. Based on his own experiences, Roland Burkhardt's Twister is a realistic and uplifting narrative that will resonate with anyone who has ever experienced or borne witness to a life upended by calamity. In Feelings, a story in seasons from Random House, a stunning illustrated journey through one young woman's year of feelings, from the saturated highs of early summer to the gray isolation of late winter. Feelings is a visual and emotional treat full of gorgeous artwork and soothing insights, said Mary Andrew, New York Times bestselling author of Am I There Yet? Enter Manjeet Thab's feelings, where you'll find moods that change as quickly as the weather, the different shades of anxiety and hope that each new season brings, and the stages of joy and pain that fuel our growth. From the spark of possibility and the jolt of creativity in high summer, to the need for release from anxiety and the pressure during monsoon, to the desolation and numbness of winter, feelings implores us to consider the seasons of our own emotional journeys. Articulating and validating the range of feelings that we all experience, this is a book that allows us to feel connected and comforted by the experiences that make us human. And Catalog Baby, a memoir of infertility from page two, a deeply moving, tragicomic graphic memoir about a single woman's efforts to conceive in her 40s. A few months after Miriam Steinberg turned 40, she decided she couldn't wait any longer to become a mother. She made the difficult decision to begin the process of conceiving a child without a partner. With her family and friends to support her, she picked a sperm donor and was on her way. But Miriam's journey was far from straightforward. She experienced the soaring highs and devastating lows of becoming pregnant and then losing her babies. She grappled with the best decision to make when choosing donors or opting for a medical procedure. She, she experienced firsthand the silence, loneliness, and taboos that come with experiences of fetal loss. Unafraid to publicize her experiences, though, she found that, in return, friends and strangers alike started sharing their own fertility stories with her. Although the lack of understanding and language around fetal loss and grief often make it very hard to navigate everyday life, she nonetheless found solace in the community around her who rallied to support her through her journey. Through it all, Miriam remained hopeful and here she unflinchingly shares her story with wry humor, honesty, and courage. Beautifully illustrated by Christache, Catalog Baby is one woman's story of tragedy and beating the odds and is a resource for all women and couples who are trying to, con to conceive. Catalog Baby is a compassionate portrait of fertility and infertility that hasn't been seen before. 
And now I feel the spill the family secrets from Harper One. Margaret Kimball's begins in an aftermath of a tragedy. In 1988, when Kimball is only four years old, her mother attempts suicide on Mother's Day. And this becomes one of the many things Kimball's family never speaks about. As she searches for answers nearly 30 years later, Kimball embarks on a thrilling visual journey into the secrets her family has kept for decades. Using old diary entries, hospital records, home videos, and other archives, Margaret pieces together a narrative map of her childhood. Her mother's bipolar disorder, her grandmother's institutionalization, and her brother's increasing struggles. In an attempt to understand what no one likes to talk about, the fractures in her family. Both a coming-of-age story about family dysfunction and a reflection on mental health, and now I spill the family secrets, is funny, poignant, and deeply inspiring in its portrait of what drives a family apart and what keeps them together. Autobiographic from Dark Horse Books a premium collection demonstrating the effectiveness of the comics medium for telling the most personal of stories, the autobiography. Showcasing some of the first published autobiographical stories from living legend artists, mainstream greats, and young indie up-and-comers. Featuring stories by Will Eisner, William Stout, Gabriel Ba, Fabio Moon, Stan Sakai, Sergio Aragones, and many more of top comics top talents. And I couldn't leave out Penny from Chronicle Books. This colorful graphic novel features the philosophical and existential musings of a cat named Penny. Told through a collection of stories, Penny, a graphic memoir, wanders through her colorful imagination as she recalls her humble beginnings on the streets of New York and waxes poetic about the realities of her sheltered life living in an apartment with her owners. Filled with Inu angst and vivid dreams, Penny provides that proves that being a cat is more profound than we once thought. A unique blend of high art and humor, Penny, a graphic memoir, perfectly portrays one cat's struggles between her animal instincts, her philosophical reflections, and the lush creature comforts of a life with human servants. Moving on to literary or slice of life stories, Shadow Life from First Second, when Kumiko's well-meaning adult daughters place her in an assisted living home, the 76-year-old widow gives it a try, but it's not where she wants to be. She goes on the lam and finds a cozy bachelor apartment, keeping the location secret even while communicating online with her eldest daughter. Kumiko reveals in the small revels in the small daily pleasures, decorating as she pleases, eating what she wants, and swimming in the community pool. But something has followed her from her former residence. Death's Shadow. Kumiko's sweet life is shattered when Death's Shadow swoops in to collect her. With her quick mind and sense of humor, Kumiko, with the help of friends new and old, is prepared for the fight of her life. But how long can an old woman thwart fate? Poet and novelist Hiromi Goto effortlessly blends wry, observational slice of life literary fiction with poetic magic realism in the tender and surprising graphic novel Shadow Life with haunting art from debut artist and Yi. Getting It Together, Volume 1 from Image Comics. Sam and Jack are best friends, and Sam is dating Lauren, Jack's indie rocker sister and roommate. Tensions skyrocket when Sam and Lauren open up their long-term relationship, sending social shockwaves through their friend group and the entire Bay Area, leaving poor Jack caught in the middle. Life gets pretty messy when you're in your 20s and your friends are your family. Newcomer artist Jenny D. Fine shines in this series about love, friendship, and rock and roll. GLAAD Award-nominated writer Sina Grace and co-creator Omar Sapahi deliver the new modern dramedy you didn't know you needed. And Save It For Later, Promises, Parenthood, and the Urgency of Protest from Harry and Abrams. Save It For Later is a reflection on the witnessing the collapse of discourse in real time while drawing the award-winning trilogy March, written by Congressman John Lewis and Andrew Iden, this generation's preeminent historical account of nonviolent revolution in the civil rights movement. Nate Powell highlights both the danger of normalized paramilitary presence symbols in consumer pop culture and the roles we play individually as we interact with our communities, families, and society at large. While six of the seven essays are new, unpublished work, Powell has also included About Face, 
a comics essay first published in Popula Online that swiftly went viral and inspired him to work to expand his work on Save It For Later. The seventh and final essay will cont contextualize the myriad of events of 2020 with the previous four years, highlighting, highlighting both the consistencies and inversions of widely shared experiences and observations amidst a massive social upheaval. As Powell moves between subjective and objective experiences, raising his children, depicted in their childhood innocence as imaginary anthropomorphic animals, he reveals the electrifying sense of trust and connection with neighbors and strangers in protest. He also explores how to equip young people with tools to make their own noise as they grow up and help shape the direction and future of this country. From Nate Powell, the National Book Award winning artist of March, this collection of graphic nonfiction essays about living in a new era of necessary protest. Next, The Stringer from MBM Publishing. Suffering from budget cuts, layoffs, and a growing suspicion that his search for the truth has become obsolete, veteran war correspondent Mark Scribner is about to throw in the towel on journalism when he discovers that his hard-earned knowledge can save his career and make him wealthy and famous. All he has to do is pivot to social media and with a few cynical twists, abandon everything he cares about most. A callback to when fact-based journalism mattered, the stringer set an important turning point, set at an important turning point a few years ago, is a globe-trotting, action-packed, timely statement about how, society, how a society without a vibrant, independent culture of reporting can denigrate into chaos and a warning of the dangers of sophisticated new technologies that enable the manufacture and modifications of truths with no basis in fact. Beatnik Buenos Aires from Fantagraphics. This atmospheric graphic novel captures the rollicking art scene of 60s Buenos Aires. When night falls in Buenos Aires, the city comes alive. Artists flock to cafes and dives to exchange ideas, listen to music, watch performance art, pen poetry, fall in love. In these raucous smoke-filled rooms, the bohemian heart and soul of this vibrant city a conflagration of creative energy burns. With the improvisational pacing of a jazz performance, Beatnik Buenos Aires follows the lives of writers, painters, musicians, sculptors, and performers as they wend their way through these hubs of creative life, seeking out inspiration and grappling with their craft. Set in 1963, this graphic novel celebrates a time in Argentine history when its art scene blossomed. Argentine creators Diego Arandojo and Facundo Percio come together to weave the rich tapestry of this mecca of artistic expression. Arandojo's staccato dialogue lends a poetic quality to these lively, often mysterious characters, while Percio's raw and expressive charcoal drawings perfectly capture the rough charm of this eclectic community of artists and the seedy, smoky locales they inhabit. Romantic, dangerous, and brimming with life, Buenos Aires in the time of the beatnik. And Hard Melody from Magnetic Press. Three 30-year-old friends reunite in Beijing after nearly 10 years apart. They used to be freewheeling rock and rollers without a care in the world, but now after tasting their own variation of freedom in New China, they are tormented by how unforgiving and unglamorous life has become. Nothing at all like the fame and fortune they dreamed about as kids. After comparing stories of disappointment over beers, they are reminded of how much youth they've lost, when a group of kids torments them into a brawl. Re-energized by the encounter, they decide to reform the band and this time take over the world. But reality gets in the way when one of them finds out his family is going to be evicted along with their whole neighborhood due to shady government zoning. Putting their dreams aside to fight for the rightful, their rightful property, they find themselves in a violent uprising, pitting neighborhood residents against police and bulldozers. And when the heat gets turned up high enough Fuses are bound to be lit. A story of youthful dreams clashing with the reality of adulthood set against the backdrop of modern China. And moving on to a pretty regular occurrence in a lot of our graphic novel titles, Crime and Horror. First, Write It in Blood from Image Comics. On the eve of their retirement, two hitmen, Cosmo and Arthur Price, 
drive through the Texas countryside with the infamous little Harkness in the trunk of their car. The brothers are meant to deliver Harkness to their boss, but matters become complicated when Arthur's recklessness jeopardizes Cosmo's retirement plans and puts a target on their backs. A tragic comic tale of family loyalty and broken dreams from Rory McConville, Joe Palmer, and Chris O'Halloran. Next, Sleeping Beauties from IDW Publishing. A bizarre sleeping sickness called Aurora has fallen over the world. Its victims can't wake up, and all of them are women. As nations fall into chaos, those women still awake take desperate measures to stay that way, and men everywhere begin to give in to their darkest impulses. Meanwhile, in the small town of Dueling, a mysterious woman has walked out of the woods. She calls herself Eve and leaves a trail of carnage in her wake. Strangest of all, she's the only woman who can wake up. The official graphic novel adaption of the horror novel by Stephen King and Owen King is a haunting interpretation of the chilling, timely bestseller. Next, Spy Island from Dark Horse Books, a new graphic novel from the team behind bestseller Man Eaters, is a terrifying, sexy, and thought-provoking espionage thriller that also happens to be laugh-out-loud funny. The world's best spies keep watch over the Bermuda Triangle from a mysterious island outpost teeming with supernatural intrigue, monsters, and evil villains set on global domination. The best of these spies is named Nora Freud, no relation. She knows 87 ways to kill someone with a cocktail toothpick, and she's used 32 of them. Lately, though, Nora has started to feel like she's going through the motions. Close the temporal portal. Assassinate the genocidal maniac. Have sex with the MI6 agent. Plus, the island's kind of gotten touristy. She agrees to one last mission, but when Nora's troubled marine cryptozoologist's sister shows up unexpectedly, warning of mermaid attacks, Nora realizes that boredom is not her biggest problem. Laugh out loud, funny, terrifying, sexy, and philosophical, Spy Island is the perfect comic book for anyone who enjoys travel, Chardonnay, Krakens, Atlantis, volcanoes, scuba diving, mermaids, ghost pirates, tropical espionage, secret agents, and or island casual Sean Connery. Moving to Love Sickness from Viz Media, Ryosuke returns to the town he once lived in because rumors are swirling about girls killing themselves after encountering, encountering a bewitchingly handsome young man. Harboring his own secret from time spent in this town, Ryosuke attempts to capture the beautiful boy and close the case. But starting with the striking bloody love sickness, this volume collects 10 stories showcasing horror master Junji Ito's in peak form, including the strange Hikizuri siblings and the rib woman. Next is Friend of the Devil from Image Comics, the next book in the Red Hot Reckless series. Best-selling crime noir masters Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips are back with another new graphic, original graphic novel featuring troublemaker for hire Ethan Reckless. It's 1985 and things in Ethan's life are going pretty well until a missing woman shows up in the background of an old B-movie and Ethan is drawn into Hollywood's secret occult underbelly as he hunts for her among the wreckage of the wild days of the 70s. Another hit graphic novel from the award-winning creators of Pulp, My Heroes Have Always Been Junkies, Criminal, and Killer Be Killed, a must-have for all Brubaker and Phillip fans. And look for the next standalone book in the Reckless series in October. And last in this section, Heavy, Volume 1, from Vault Comics. Bill may be dead, but he's got a job to do. Welcome to the big wait, where folks who don't quite make the cut go to work off their debt. Everyone in the wait's got a job. Bill's is a heavy whose job is policing the multiverse, making sure bad eggs get what's coming to them. He's on track to earn his climb and reunite with the woman he loves until he meets his new partner, the worst dude of all time. Heavy is the punisher for neurotics, inception for the impatient, preacher for, well, it's a lot like preacher. Max Bemis and Eric Donovan bring you a story about the existential purpose of dumb boys with big guns. And one more category, science fiction and supernatural. First Rogue Planet from Oni Press. Sci-Fi Wire said Rogue Planet is an old-fashioned throwback to wild science fiction sagas of yesteryear, punctuated with unbridled storytelling and bold imaginative artwork. 
Rogue Planet is a twisting descent into cosmic horror from an all-star creative team. Salvage vessel Cortez tracks the lonely orphan planet with a planet with no star system to call its own. Somewhere on this hostile rock is a payload fit for a king. To attain it, though, the crew of the Cortez must brave razor rock, poisonous vapors, treacherous footing, and the most mind-numbing horrors imaginable. Struggling to stay alive, they are beset at every turn by horrors from their own nightmares. Now they have to discover that they are not alone on the planet, and with and the other inhabitants welcome them as sacrifices to an elder god. Stranded on a vicious, murderous, seemingly intelligent planet, the crew of the Cortez must reevaluate what it truly means to survive and what they are willing in, to do in order to spare their own lives. And count from humanoids. Framed for treason and wrongfully imprisoned at the hands of a jealous and corrupt magistrate, Redaxon Samud escapes his breathtaking hover prison with only one thing on his mind, revenge. Disguised as a man of status with a newfound fortune and his automaton retainer unit, Aru, by his side, Samud sets out to dismantle the lives of those who have wronged him. But when innocent lives begin to get caught in the middle of his quest for vengeance, Samud will have to decide between using his new fortune for the good of the people or to pursue the revenge he so desperately desires. This is a sci-fi reimagining of the greatest... Oops. Let's go back one. A sci-fi reimagining of the greatest revenge story of all times, The Count of Monte Cristo. Now we're on to Vampire Masquerade Volume 1 from Vault Comics. When Cecily Bain, an enforcer for the Twin Cities vampire, vampiric elite, takes a mysterious new vampire under her wing, she's dragged into an insidious conspiracy. Will she be able to escape with her unlife and protect her aging Alzheimer's afflicted sister? Or will she be yet another pawn sacrificed to maintain the age-old secrets that vampires exist among the living? Meanwhile, on the outskirts of the city, a rebellious found family of vampire castouts investigates a vicious, vicious killing Immerse yourself in the hit comic series based on the world of the international best-selling tabletop role-playing game, Vampire the Masquerade. This is Shadow Service Volume 1 from Vault Comics. Worried your partner is cheating? Need a missing person found? Gina Myers is the private investigator for you. Sure, she's a witch who worries that her powers make her more a monster than the crooks she's trying to catch, but it's not like London's criminal underworld is literally going to hell, is it? Spycraft meets magic meets black magic in the shadowy world of MI666. And deceased dead planet from DC Comics. Five years have passed since Earth was evacuated following the deadly outbreak of the anti-life equation. Their survivors have found a home on Earth too, but it's a tenuous existence until the new Justice League receives a faint distress call from Earth. Can life possibly still exist on this dead planet? The new league, led by Damian Wayne, John Kent, and Cassie Sandsmark, the new Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, must return home, but who or what is lying in wait for these fearless heroes? The New York Times bestselling creators of deceased Tom Taylor and Trevor Hairsign return to tell the next chapter in this epic saga. And one more in this with Commanders in Crisis, Volume 1, The Action, out from Image Comics. The last survivors of the multiverse live among us under new superhero identities. Five survivors of doomed worlds taking a second chance to ensure our world lives on. This is a new twist on strange superhero comics with a bleeding edge eye on the modern moment. Commanders in Crisis follows the footsteps of Doom Patrol and Thunderbolts as five unexpected heroes come together to solve a myrtle unlike any other. The victim, compassion itself. This is Idea Side, a new series by state acclaimed writer Steve Orlando and artist David Tinto, an intense weird action thriller reminding us about the importance of compassion and hope in the present moment and putting fists to faces along the way. And a couple of bonus titles in the category I'm calling Netflix. Uh, first Tales from Umbrella Academy, You Look Like Death, Volume 1, from Dark Horse Books. Creator... Umbrella Academy creators Gerard Way and Gabrielle Baugh are joined by Way's Killjoy's co-writer Sean Simon for a supernatural adventure featuring the breakout character from the hit Netflix show. 
when 18-year-old Klaus gets himself kicked out of the Umbrella Academy and his allowance discontinued, he heads to a place where his ghoulish talents will be appreciated, Hollywood. But after a magical high on a stash stolen from a vampire drug lord, Klaus needs help and doesn't have his siblings there to save him. The first Umbrella Academy spinoff miniseries with a forward by Robert Sheehan, who portrays Klaus in the hit Netflix series. And one more, Warrior Nun Dora, Volume 1 from Avatar Press, now a Netflix original series, relaunches for readers of all kinds with a new nun and new attitude. The satanic panic of the 80s has fallen away to a new wave of rebellious kids in rural Pennsylvania in the 1990s. Dora, a grunge-obsessed teen, is caught in the middle of what appears to be a dark ritual and is sent away to a secret school by her devoutly religious parents. There, Dora is shocked to find a group of nuns that fight against the forces of evil. But when undead horror comes Dora's way, what will this misfit do to protect herself? Have faith in Warrior Nun. This volume has the complete first Dora story. That's my portion. I hope you found some titles to add to your to-be-read list. Until next time, thanks for listening.